Okay. Welcome to this research in practice event held on the 7th of July, 2021. I'm Jacqueline Baker, your host, and also your speaker today. I'm based in Melbourne and I work as a researcher at Cox Architecture. I've also invited my colleague, direct, uh, Cox Director Karen Clutson. She's based in our Canberra office to speak today. Canberra has been an interior designer for 25 years. She studied interior design at Teesside University in the north of England, and then worked in practice on project, projects from hospitality to workplace. Mid-career, Karen had a little bit of a change and worked for a financial services provider delivering design strategy across retail and workplace. After that, she actually started lecturing in design and brand management at Regents College in London. Then after moving to Australia, Karen started working as an interior designer in various uh, design practices in Australia before joining Cox six years ago. A little about myself, my career began in architecture, but before I completed my studies, uh, halfway through my fourth year, I was drawn to the field of environmental psychology because I was fascinated by the impact of the built environment on human behaviour. I found I was much more interested in the social science um, part of architecture than, than design. So I decided to switch careers and pursued a master's of environmental design uh, environmental psychology at the University of Surrey in the UK. After that, I worked for an engineering company as a researcher and a project manager. In 2018, I completed my PhD at Monash University, which I consider to be my biggest achievement and definitely my most rewarding. After eight years studying and teaching, both at the Monash Business School and uh, MADA, Monash Art Design and Architecture, I decided to transition back to industry. I've been working at Cox Architecture for two years now. Um, so we, we, we have a presentation to show you, which is um, one of the first few, so as you may know, Cox has a new research and development program that has been going for around 12 months now. And the research that I wanna share with you today is, is the second piece of research that we've undertook to undertaken as part of that program. So we've titled this, um, the New Workplace 2021, perceptions and practices in a post-COVID flexible world. Um, so the, a bit of an overview, the presentation is split into three main parts. So the first part is about the data that we collected. The second uh, is about what the data is telling us. And the third is the design insights that we've been able to draw from that data. As we all know, COVID was responsible for a sudden change to the way organisations operated with all non-essential businesses transitioning to the home environment, remote and flexible working arrangements. After a few months, however, research began to emerge that employees did want to go back to work, well, at least some of the time, not all the time. And we, as a design practice, started to wonder how we can equip our workplace designers with evidence-informed knowledge to underpin the future of workplace design. So the, the main purpose of our study was to gain insight into the practices and perceptions of our workplace clients in response to the impact of COVID-19. We interviewed Austra all of, well, not all of them, but some of our Australian, Cox Australian workplace clients Sorry, does someone have a question? I can just hear hear someone. No. Um, I, I think could you could I ask you to mute if you're not muted? Awesome. Um, so we we interviewed our workplace clients across the nation. This gave us like a really important opportunity to actually 
uh, have a conversation with clients that we have previously done workplaces for. Um, but it also afforded us the opportunity to speak to organisations in various states of COVID restrictions. So when we did the study, uh, Melbourne was in, a, in lockdown, Brisbane was free to move about as they liked, as was most of the rest of the country. So, so it, it really captured uh, where we were at that time in varying states, depending on their geographical location. Um, so respondents reflected on the time since they first began working from home in March 2020 whilst answering COVID-related questions about, about, about their particular organisation's experiences. We were lucky enough to get a great sample that spanned eight sectors. That was finance, mining, infrastructure, sports, construction and property, civic and government, education and health and research. Uh, rather, we used a convenient sampling technique. So, so what that means is we invited the clients that we thought uh, might be interested or might enjoy uh, being interviewed and being part of our study rather than a random sampling technique. Participation involved interviews. So uh, we interviewed our clients, uh, two of us interviewed. You can see Ashley Robinson there. Ashley and I did many, but there were also more in our team. Um, so we, we interviewed people together um, and it took around 30 minutes. However, some clients were very talkative. So some of them took up to an hour. And as you can see from the infographics at the bottom uh, right hand side of the page, 30% of our participants were working from home at the time of the interview, and almost 60% of the participants were working at the office, not full time, but they were in the office at the time of the interview. And you can also see that 4% were neither at home or in the office, they were actually in their car. So the, the, the survey or the interview covered seven main areas. The first one was the work environment preferences. So we asked our clients on a task by task basis, what is your preference uh, for this task in the home environment or the office environment? We also talked about uh, the return to work plans for each organisation, flexibility around work arrangements, their investment in technology, any spatial modifications or, or um, changes, like complete changes moving out of the office that, that they were planning, uh, perceived uh, productivity. So basically we talked about how productivity went when they first started working from home and then um, whether, whether or not that was consistent and just how that went for different organisations. And then we also spoke about the uh, impact on future operations, so what they expect um, to happen in the next three to five years. The first finding uh, was not at all, uh, was not unsurprising. So um, around three quarters of organisations reported that focused work was much more effective working from home. But so uh, that, that's shown by the, the yellowy orange section um, that shows how many people uh, prefer to do focus work at home. But as you can see by the green section, 15% actually said that they preferred to work in the office. And when we uh, dug a little deeper, we found that that, that was uh, completely understandable because some people had uh, were... Uh, for example, had a, had a family in a very small apartment and they didn't have enough room to work from home or they were homeschooling or they just had babies and it was all, all quite, quite difficult. Um, Karen, would you like to add something to this? Yeah, I think one of the points that we are seeing coming through quite strongly in this area is that that focus work at home has really um, impacted in the general work environment because there's now an erosion of tolerance for noise. So acoustics has always been a, a kind of big issue in workplace and open plan. But this kind of change to working at home is really is really impacting on what now is provided in the workplace. Thanks, Karen. So this next um, statistic shows that we, we asked people um, 
whether unscheduled collaboration, you know, what, what is often termed a water cooler chat or bumping into each other in the hallway or around the coffee machine, the spontaneous collaboration that occurs just by being um, like by providing um, certain amenity in an environment. Uh, we ask people, you know, uh, how was that for you at home? And so 82% of clients felt that it was completely unable to be replicated virtually. So, so the, this, this wasn't really happening in a lot of organisations, which, um, you know, obviously, particularly in offices like Melbourne, where we were at home for a really extended period of time, we, we missed out on this type of collaboration, which, as we all know, definitely um, affects innovation in organisations. As one of our clients said, workplace is about collaboration, well-being and culture. Now, now, these two donut charts show that um, office culture experiences and networking and business development are much more conducive to the work environment, uh, according to our clients. Just moving on to this one. So collaboration and ideation with both clients and colleagues is also much more conducive to the office environment. And this is not not an unexpected result. But as you can see from the bottom donut chart, um, so almost 20% uh, uh, of the people either preferred collaboration and ideation with colleagues in the home environment, or they didn't mind which environment this occurred in. Now with these two charts, you can see that the green section, which is uh, indicating a preference for the office environment is just over half. So just over half of organisations found that general communication with colleagues and client meetings was more conducive to the office environment. And you can see by the red sections of the donut, donut charts that most people just don't mind where these two tasks are performed. They, they, they didn't mind whether it was at home or in the office. Now, these two donut chart, charts show that less than 50% of clients felt that presentations to externals, so, so uh, presentations to people outside of their organisations and managing their own performance and wellbeing was preferred in the office. So people preferred these two tasks in the home environment or, or they didn't mind at all. This one, this one's quite a unique uh, finding. So um, about a, only a third of people felt that in-house presentations, so presenting uh, within their organisation was more conducive to the office environment. So with the other like two thirds, like didn't mind, were either preferred it at home or didn't mind at all which environment. As one of our clients said, it can be better remote as you can cover bigger audiences faster but you don't get the audience feedback to help guide what you're saying. So in other words, it may be much more efficient to, um, to present within the organisation at, at home, but you are missing out on cues that you would normally get if you were to present within the office environment. Um, we also found that the COVID experience for our clients ranged from being extremely positive to drastically damaging to their businesses. We saw a, a big range and it wasn't um, sector specific. Um, also, all participating organisations have a unique plan for transitioning to back to work. So even though you know everyone went uh, with government guidelines, they still had very unique plans to their organisation. There were no two alike. Um, most organisations said that um, even though they're much more open and flexible to work arrangements than ever before, they were already starting these conversations or they, were all, they already had great flexible policies in place before COVID arrived. So that, that was a, a really promising finding. Uh, we also found that clients are investing in workplace modifications. So, um, so you know that depended. That some of them said they were would um, 
anything would do anything that that didn't cost money and others were obviously um, majorly changing their meeting rooms to smaller and adding booths and things like that uh, we, when we spoke about productivity uh, most clients said not all but most said that productivity has dipped a little since first working from home. So initially what they found is that most of their people were working much longer hours, but productivity remained the same. So they were working uh, longer hours to achieve what they would normally achieve at work. But after a while, particularly um, in Melbourne, that, that dipped and that seemed to coincide with um, uh, homeschooling when people started to have to homeschool and the, the ongoing nature of the work from home situation. The novelty wears off and you have to be disciplined about your boundaries, one of our clients said to us. More than 10% of organisations are in advanced stages of restructuring their organisations on the back of opportunities afforded by COVID. So, for example, um, some of our clients were selling CBD real estate, starting up satellite offices and turning their offices, offices into co-working spaces. Um, so what is all this data actually telling us? Well, there's three main things. Firstly, focused work is much more conducive to the home environment. Secondly, employees are completely flexible about working either at home or in the office environment when they're participating in presentations and meetings and when they're communicating with colleagues. However, thirdly, this is the most interesting for us as architects, all tasks requiring collaboration, culture and human connections, such as networking and business development and, the, and the, the water cooler chats, the spontaneous collaboration are much more conducive to the office environment and enormously difficult to replicate virtually. I'm now going to hand over to Karen Clutson and she's going to explain um, what all this means in terms of design. Oh, hopefully not for every, there's lots of creative people on the line, but um, I've got some insight. So obviously we're based in Canberra. Uh, we do a lot of work with government, which as an organization going through workplace change is pretty unique compared to lots of other private sector clients because of the way that they're set up. So COVID has had a fairly significant impact on what's happening here, which when you look at how slow to move the impact and the um, influence of the unions on what it means for staffing, um, COVID has, is bringing some quite big changes that are very much supported by the data that Jacqueline has just gone through. And what we are seeing, I think one of the most significant thing is changing requirements around um, building typologies and client briefs. So um, the impact of the COVID on challenging preconceptions around how access was gained into tenancies, um, how we might flex um, arrival into buildings given all the issues that Melbourne and Sydney had with um, lift access. So thinking more, we've seen a much more um, holistic consideration about how can we manage that long term around access into buildings? How do you fragment buildings to make sure that there's elements that are accessible, that closed down doesn't impact on an entire building, that maybe our buildings are fragmented into more, component, uh, into more compartments? And how do we think about um, how can we include more diversity, particularly in the mix and the way that people are working within those spaces? Um, we're also seeing changes in the way that um, clients are asking for their amenity. So our touchless toilets, for example, that everybody's aware of, just more investment in that base building um, amenity to make sure that they're ready for the future. Um, we are seeing a lot of changes in the way that the workplace strategy is um, being influenced by the things that Jacqueline has talked about. And I think if Canberra is able to think about innovation and staff retention and is on board now with thinking more flexibly and home working and um, working in the office. Um, we can see that there is really a huge move in that area. And we're seeing it not just moving from um, the property area, but coming through from the people. So there's now a recognition um, of what that impact is in the workplace. We're seeing greater fragmentation of the way that um, the workplace is being considered. So how do we? How are the teams being supported back in the office? So going back to all of that data that Jacqueline's talked about, how can teams come to work and almost work in studios while they're in the workplace? Um, so that 
that they can have that noise, that activity that they want without impacting on the right, on the wider, um, wider teams around. We're also seeing some quite significant changes in what staff are wanting whilst they're in the office. Um, I think anybody who's worked in federal government will know that they're all very special at times. And so if we're seeing, we're seeing a much more, more dramatic increase in the inclusion and development of wellness strategies. So what is it that wellness is within these organizations? What, so beyond just our carers, our family spaces, but thinking about spaces where um, parents can bring their children to, to work. So we're seeing a lot more inclusion of investment and solutions where parents are, in, are, are encouraged to bring their um, kids to school, uh, kids to the office, they can do homework clubs. There's elements like that. We're seeing a lot more settings um, that are coming through um, to think about the inclusion and inclusivity of wider participants in the office. So addressing some senses of um, equality around maybe contractors versus permanent staff, trying to bring that sense of togetherness back into the space. Um, we're seeing changes in what people are needing. So that working from home, we talked about that lack of tolerance um, and that's now coming back through in the workplace. We're seeing a lot more need for diversity of settings. Um, a big word that's come through in the work that Connie who's online and myself are doing was inclusivity and diversity of need. So how do you address um, unique needs within the environment that have been addressed while people are being at home, but once they come into the office, they're expecting you to consider um, hyper-responsive environments that allow them to manage the lighting levels, the noise levels, their sensitivities to smell. If they've, if they've survived and recovered from um, domestic abuse, how can we place them in environments where they feel safe? So a lot more of these um, issues about inclusivity and diversity of design are coming through now in our workplace briefs as we look at what does the post-COVID uh, environment look like. And and we're seeing suggestions that um, that mobility is going to inflate when and where tasks occur. So, for example, we're seeing we're seeing um, I think news reports and kind of thought pieces that saying, "Hey, people are going to work at home in the morning; they're going to pop into the office in the afternoon." We're starting to see clients look at how what does that mean in terms of parking? What does that mean in terms of um, how and what the strategies are with regards to hub and spoke, and whether we've got satellite offices as previously mentioned. But we're also seeing that possible in smaller locations. And although Canberra is supposedly a city, the, it's very easy to get around. And we are seeing much more fragmentation in the way that work is done in our more regional hub projects and the smaller towns where, yes, we're having a much more increased diversity of activities to support the data that um, Jacqueline reported around presentations, but also focus work. So a real elongation and extension of what is considered the workplace and the uh, places that we can do activity. That's all from me. Thanks. Thanks so much, Karen. So that that's our presentation. Um, thank you very much for listening. Just wondering if you have any questions. Or does anybody disagree with anything? That would be really mm -hmm. interesting. Has anybody got alternative perspectives? Um, it's not really an alternative perspective, but I do think that the well-being aspect is just really difficult to manage for some people and very variable depending upon yeah, what the conditions are in the home. So yeah, I'm interested if you have any more anecdotal stuff you have about working from home and well-being that you collected over that time? I think that I haven't got anything, but one of the things that is keeps coming up and has come up at other events is who's responsible for the well-being at home, who's responsible for the work health and safety and ensuring that that ongoing working at home doesn't lead to longer term issues that we're not aware of. And we're repeatedly getting asked by clients and other organisations, who, what is the solution to that? So I don't have an answer actually. No, I don't have an I don't have an answer either. Um, people did though, as, as I showed you, fifteen percent of people were firmly wanting to work in the office to do focused work, and when we dug a little deeper and asked for reasons, they did cite 
um, you know, difficult circumstances at home. Um, uh, one particular person was saying, um, you know, that they lived in a sort of one bedroom apartment and they had a family and um, somebody, the table was needed for um, the wife to do her work, the child to do her homework and the uh, other uh, the person we were speaking to worked on the floor. So, um, you know, uh, you touched on, you know, violence, but um, that wasn't that wasn't really mentioned probably. I can understand why it wasn't, but, yeah, there were a lot of um, other difficult s circumstances cited. Ashley, do you remember any other anecdotal comments that came up? Off the top of my head, I can go through and share share them with the group if that's beneficial um, for, fa for factual. Um, but We've I got some well, hands up as well. Wellbeing, I think it was mentioned that a couple of companies hadn't reached out to a lot of their workforce to check on their well-being and that was a huge issue and one that they raised internally um other, but then on the other side of the spectrum I think it was in um an interview I did with Tristan actually um someone who worked within education had said that she'd never spoken to her team so much before and they checked in with each other every day and, and their well-being so a lot of people were having very different experiences mentally. Thanks, Ashley. Are there any, are there any more questions? Um, uh, Jacqueline, I, I do. Yep. I, I, well, I, I have two questions, I guess. Um, and also, full disclosure, I'm, I, I'm kind of close to the research in, in some ways, so I know a bit about it. But I guess my first question would be about um, would there be different um, insights to be found if the respondents were not necessarily managers or management, you know, because I think what you might get is different perceptions when it comes to executive or management um, people in an office versus the actual workers themselves. Um, and I think that's a really valuable thing. And I think that's in a lot of research that has happened in this space, that's possibly been a blind spot in a sense, because because we, we, we talk a lot about the workers and how they're going to work in these spaces, but we don't necessarily include them as active agents in the decision making um, of the spaces that they work in. And, I, and the second question would be, um, would it, there be value in kind of doing a, a, another round of this research uh, effectively a year on um, where, you know, the kind of the shock of COVID has, has changed and it's much more of a, a enduring thing now. And would we find different responses? I think that could be quite interesting as well. Thanks, Tristan. I know, is it Marianne? Do you have, have something you wanted to say, Marianne? Yes, thank you. Um, as some of you might know, our um, expertise is in built environment accessibility. And so I was wondering whether the research uncovered any kind of um, findings around people with disabilities experiences in the workplace environment, working from home, working from the office, et cetera. No, no, it didn't. It didn't, Marianne. We, we didn't discuss, we didn't discuss that and it was, it didn't come up. Yeah which I find interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but um, it's it's not, I can understand why um, some organisations, but they range from about 50 employees, 50 employees to around 50,000. So yeah, it wasn't something, something that came up during this, this wellbeing uh, type of questioning. Because, yes, as a generalisation, the sorts of things that I've heard is that, on one hand, many people with disability have been very pleased with the working from home situation because it has allowed them to do certain things that they haven't been able to and they've been able to, you know, not have to commute into the office and that sort of thing. But on the other hand, the potential for increasing invisibility um, is also 
a major concern. And if, if things, and going back to a brief comment that was made before about who's responsible for work health and safety at home and that sort of thing, you know, what happens when the technology doesn't work and you've got nobody to fix it and you can't do anything about it yourself? Yeah. That's a good question. I was yeah. going to say, um, I guess we're involved with uh, a couple of projects at the moment for federal government with thousands of employees and actually probably some of the biggest participants in the development of what the post-COVID workplace has been is our disability network, our carers network, all of, and actually it's been the input and the suggestions they provided have been amazing, but it's, but we are noticing the difference depending on whether they're in early at the conception pre-design. Pre and because we've got the proper process where we've got the people, the technology and the um, organization ready to go, when we can talk to people before a design solution and it's not just change management down the track, we really are getting those opportunities to address that. But it, get, it just come, seems to be coming down to timing in the organization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Marianne. I can see Andrew, Andy Lyons, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks, um, Alex. Uh, the other, similar to um, Marianne, the, the last question, um, I think a bit of, I don't think your survey touched on it, but I think the way people got to their workplaces was a factor in how they, um, you know, diff distance from workplace, whether they were forced to take the train and maybe didn't feel safe on the train, um, you know, because of maybe contracting COVID in Melbourne, particularly more than more than other places. I, I think it's probably, I would suspect if we, you know, in the Cox Melbourne office, we've got people um, up until recently commuting from Bendigo and, uh, sorry, Ballarat. And um, I'm pretty sure they were pretty delighted to be at home, not necessarily because they were, thought it was more productive or whatever, but just that it, it cut, you know, more than two or three hours of transit time out of their life that they simply didn't have to do. So I reckon that it, it, it's perhaps not part of this. It's probably, I'm not sure it has a bearing on how offices are organised, but it, it has a bearing on how people have reacted to being locked down, I think, and, and their, you know, what the, the state of the state of play vis-a-vis, -vis, um, yeah, both, both tedium and danger, <laughs> and, you know, like potential danger in their um, commutes. Yeah, uh, thanks. It probably um, uh, is a huge barrier for people that uh, have long commutes, as you were suggesting, um, to come back to the office, which leads into a comment that I've just read that Alex has written. Alex, would you like to um, would you like to explain what you mean by your your comment here in the comment section? Oh, look, I, I just thought I'd add um, some of our recent experience on a, on a large workplace project that we were designing um, post-lockdown, um, so a little bit later than the time at which you were doing your research, Jacqueline, and some of the key themes in terms of the design of the workplace um, were things such as how we actually get people back into the office because this particular organisation had a very, very low uptake of people wanting to come back into the office. So a lot of the design was about uh, come back beyond just the benefits of collaborating and, and meeting with colleagues. Um, some of the other key themes that kept coming up in our, in our consultations were breaking down um, this barrier between work from home and work from office, um, because particularly in terms of presentations that are happening in the office and also happening online, there's, there's barriers for people um, there. And, and so that creating that digital um, equality was really important. Um, and then there were um, wider workplace issues, which are always discussed, and that's workplace density. But in this particular project, we ended up going down with a really, really low workplace uh, workplace density in terms of uh, desk sharing. And um, that was quite a significant shift from previous projects. So that was, yeah, there was some, some big design um, shifts that, that have been introduced into this project. And Christina, I know you're online. I don't know if you wanted to add anything else to that, um, but it was, yeah, it was certainly an interesting project to be involved in, um, in a post-COVID kind of environment. 
Uh, I think you've covered most of it, Alex. I think the um, big brief we kept getting back from the client was make it exciting and engaging. Um, you know, that, that it was really about, and it's not just the design that's actually the focus, it's actually the um, culture and activities that the organisation will have to take on to make these spaces work. So it's, it's funny that the design process has um, really stopped to think about what does the organisation's um, uh, cultural integration and curriculum need to bring in to the organisation to help people and to entice people to come back into the office. So that's been a big part of the conversation and the thinking um, in the design process. Thanks, Alex and Christina. Are there any more questions? Were you surprised by any of the findings reported? Uh, I no, <laughs> no, not really. Um, probably, I was surprised um, at that that many people preferred to do focus, like 15% of people preferred to do focus work from the workplace. I was very surprised. But then after um, understanding all these different people's circumstances, which, you know, I didn't, I really didn't know, um, then, then it totally it totally made sense. But really those having them in the three categories where people there were some tasks people preferred from home, some they didn't mind, and some they were actually um, were, were much more conducive to to the work environment and they weren't happening, such as um, business development and networking. Um, so I, I was a little bit surprised about that that uh, whilst it, it would have Obviously, like those results didn't come out, out at 100%. There were some really amazing companies, particularly in the finance sector, who said that they had found ways to um, do those tasks virtually. I was quite surprised about that. Thanks, thanks, Will, for your question. Are there any other yes. questions, comments? Um, I just wanted to ask if you'd looked into specific, more specifics around the um, people in built environment in terms of redesign for, for architectural studios or offices. Did you think that the um, types of work of an architectural studio would result in different results rather than looking at the whole spectrum of industries so so what we did was we this study actually looked at um, our clients industries not not ours so uh, so it was across those eight sectors and one of those sectors was um, construction and property which will probably probably fit into that category um so so no we didn't look at architectural studios specifically we we're actually uh really focusing on our what our clients uh needs were yeah but but karen do you have some insights about that i'm not really sorry kim forgive me i'm not really sure on the question so the question is um this the study was looking at your clients across those I think you said eight sectors and one of the sectors was construction and property. And I was just wondering, did the results from construction and property or did the results between the different sectors change a lot? Oh, is that okay? That's that's slightly different. Um, the, the results between the sectors, um, we, and we, we won't be able to reveal them. Um, because that's um, that's part of the agreement that we had with with our clients. So uh, by revealing the differences, you would you, they might and may be able to be identified. So uh -huh. that's one that's one of the limitations of this study. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you considered um, 
has Cox considered doing research into its own workplace and how it might change post-COVID? Yes, we are. We are doing research into our own workplace, uh, particularly as um, uh, one or more may be considering a move. So, yeah, we are doing that kind of research in uh, at least three of the six locations that I know of. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Do you know what the main kind of concerns are that might cause a change? Or? No, I'm just designing the survey at the moment. So oh, okay. the survey, so really the survey might, will identify the concerns. Yeah. I might give you a, um, a bit of thinking from our end. So um, I am uh, look after the interior design team in the Melbourne office and we've probably had the biggest impact from COVID and I would say the last um, lockdown number four has actually caused us probably the most, um, I think, grief to some extent because we feel like we've gone back a few months and when we're in the office, the biggest um, challenges we face at the moment is these online meetings, online meetings and um, being able to Sorry, I've got six children at home today, which is why I'm trying to listen in and juggle at the same time. But um, Zoom meetings and having those kind of quick interface um, meetings with people that are set at home, the office is just not set up for it. So that's actually going to be our biggest pressure, especially on the Melbourne office, to um, integrate those kind of settings in. You know, they need to be impromptu as well as small scale so people are having those one-on-one -on -one discussions and can see your face like we're seeing your faces versus a big room with a tiny little face in that which is um, the setup we have in our office at the moment so what we're finding is people are staying home to have zoom meetings because the office just is not allowing the settings to do that um, and then there's a whole raft of um, other pressures people have you know wearing masks all day just, you know, I prefer to stay home than wear a mask all day. That's come through quite a lot. Um, how we're uh, limited by visitors and people that can come in the office. I think all of those are cultural pieces and um, is the challenges we face about how we can bring people together. And we as people, I think, uh, to Karen's point at the start, uh, have become very um, fearful of noise, activity, being around people, actually having conversations. And that big cultural thing um, is coming is coming through a lot, and we're seeing it. We've just had um, our mid-year reviews with fifty percent of our staff, and having just sat through twenty odd discussions, that's the one thing everybody's saying they're missing having catch-ups and chats with their peers um, and and buddies. So having the space to allow them to do that, I think, is going to be our biggest challenge. I concur with you, Christina, because we're currently looking at how can you bring 3,000 people together? We know that we've got to provide all the focus space because everybody is, gets grumpy about that. But actually, if you're doing Teams meetings or you're trying to VC, you don't really want to be away from your work point, yep. but you don't want the disturbance on the rest of the people. So there's this kind of dichotomy now between having your, your desk, which might be an active environment versus yep. the focused environments. So there's a work setting right. missing yeah. in the middle and there now. And the fear is that we'll go back to uh, work points with screens all around us, which is, you know, what we've been, you know, what we had and, and have been pushing against for so many years. So um, there's a fine line how we get this right. So, yes, Jacqueline has been, you know, we've been damping on that door to try and get a bit of a research piece, but getting those right questions out to the team is just as important um, that, you know, we're going through the right process to do that. Great, great question, Kim. Definitely. Yeah, and I would add a layer of architectural and construction type offices have collaboration at a very different level to diff other industries. And I think that's where we've suffered the most. Um, missing, you know, drawing on boards together and scribbling each other's ideas. I think that's actually the biggest missing piece that other industries probably don't understand from um, the architectural industry to your question Kim great thanks um, 
I was looking at the data thinking the same thing that collaboration would, would probably be a problem um, and training. And it was a big problem for a lot of grads that you weren't part of the process and it was difficult to orient yourself without other staff there. You've hit the nail on the head. The reviews we've just had with the um, graduates of one year out feel like their career actually froze for a year and they did the same task for a year because there was actually lacking mentorship to learn a new task. Um, and that's actually been the biggest um, concentration that we, we need to change over the next year for us and awareness that some of those grads that are now two years out have only really had one year experience working in team environments. Um, and that's, you know, the biggest piece for us, how we actually grow them into the team. So we're, we're asking, especially our senior leadership team to make effort to be in the office now to champion, not just the grads, but the new starters to our office as well. So new starters is also a big piece and anyone that started with us over COVID is their, their biggest comment to us now is I still don't feel like I'm part of a group yet because they haven't actually sat around a table with people. It's better now, but that is their biggest um, kind of complaint or gripe that, you know, that they still don't feel as integrated as everybody else. Yeah, we, um, we, put, on, we put on a professional placement um, in our Melbourne office two years, uh, sorry, two weeks before we went into, uh, we had to start working from home. And that was that was really, really difficult for that particular person because um, you basically hadn't really gotten to know anyone except, you know, a, a handful of introductions. So, yeah, that's just one person that I know of. But, yeah, there's a, we've had quite a few new starters this year that have been affected. Yeah. Thanks, Kim. Are there, are there any more questions? Okay, well, um, I think you're going to be speaking, aren't you, next time, Marianne? Yes, yeah, so Marianne's going to be speaking. Do you, Have you got a topic yet? What, what are you calling your piece? Um, our shorthand title is Victoria's Bathrooms. And the background is that over the years, I've been involved in a government service um, that was run through Archie Centre, where we went to people's houses, people over 60, people with disability, um, and provided advice about you know, bathrooms and ramps, often in conjunction with occupational therapists. And a couple of years ago, with colleagues at Melbourne University, we were able to get some funding to collate those reports. And we were able to collate 14,000 reports, but we've only been able to look at a couple of hundred. But what we're endeavouring to do, we've picked out four architects and 50, rec, um, 50 reports from each of those architects, three in metropolitan Melbourne, in different suburb, different areas of Melbourne, and one in regional Victoria, and we're trying to figure out what are the typical bathrooms that people actually have in their houses and how that this cohort of people, so people over 60 and um, people with disability, how do those typical bathrooms compare to what we're trying to promote these days with Livable Housing Australia, um, silver and gold um, level guidelines, for instance, which is what's coming into the um, BCA next year, we hope. And also how do those bathrooms um, compare against 1428, um, you know, accessible bathrooms, for instance? Because the general idea that we're kind of working towards, which, with, which our experience tells us, is that it's all very well schemes like the NDIS being available to do home modifications, but the NDIS only goes up to age 65. Um, and the state of the Australian housing that most people live in is problematic. What are we going to do about the existing housing? So 
we're trying to establish that this is um, empirically what the existing bathrooms are like. How do we get from that to what people should be able to enjoy to live their lives properly? So that's a bit of background. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Marianne. So we've got that to look forward to. In, uh, so the first Wednesday of next month. Yep. Thanks, Marianne. And, and thank you for the great discussion, everyone. That was fantastic. Thanks for all the questions and the comments, the discussion. And, and thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Jacqueline. Thank See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.